Hi, this is Rustic of Still Shadows, and I'm presenting for you a conference from 2014 entitled The History of Today's Problems in the Church by Bishop Donald J. Sanborn, His Excellency. This took place in Budapest, Hungary in 2014. The entire video has translators repeating after the bishop his sentences and he sits and waits for the interpreter to make those statements and so I've gone ahead and I've edited out that whole portion and shortened the time so that it's only the English you hear and then at the end there's a question and answer session that has the questions that the Hungarians are asking written in the bottom of the screen so you'll be able to follow along with the English responses that His Excellency provides. I'm hoping this makes this video a little shorter, uh, more comfortable, and easier to really concentrate and keep a consistency of thought throughout. So I'm real pleased to bring this to you. I hope you enjoy it. And if you enjoy the channel and haven't subscribed yet, it would really be great if you would click that button for subscribe and click the bell for notifications for new uploads and also give a thumbs up if you like the content it helps bypass these algorithms and the lack of recommendations even this kind of content is uh, being overly watched by the higher-ups okay so on with the conference <coughs> In nome de Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Veni Sancte Spiritus, Vecte Tuorum Core Fidelium, et Tui Mori Signe, Signe Macende, Emite Spiritum Tuum, et Crea Buntur, et Reino Babis Facium Terre, Oremus Deus Core Fidelium, Sancti Spiritus Illus Facium et Ocuisti, Ta Nobis in Iodem Spiritu Recta Sapere, et Eius in Per Consolatione Gaudere, Per Christum Dominum Nostrum, Amen. Sedes Sapientiae, Ora Per Nobis, In nome de Patris et Filii et Spiritus, to sanity, amen. <coughs> <coughs> Today I would like to speak to you about the general problem in the Catholic Church that has existed for the past 50 years. And my approach will be to give you a history of this problem uh, as briefly as I possibly can because it is a long history. We must start actually approximately 500 years ago with the Renaissance. The Renaissance marked the end of the Christian civilization in which the Catholic faith was the primary factor in deciding and determining everything in life. In this period of the Renaissance, we see the rise of two major movements. One is humanism, the other is naturalism. Humanism was the movement that wanted to see man as man, that is, man without any reference to his creator and man without any reference to original sin. For this reason, in Renaissance art, you see the beginning of paintings where people have no clothing because clothing is a sign of original sin. It is also the time of the rise of naturalism which is to have a cult of nature without any reference to the creator as if there were no creator and as if our nature were not stained by original sin. Concomitant with the Renaissance was the Protestant Revolt. In the Protestant Revolt, we see, first of all, a revolution against the authority of the Catholic Church. We also see, and this is very important for modernism, the movement of the free interpretation of Scripture. This doctrine of free interpretation will give rise to the following things. 
first of all, the primacy of human conscience over any religious authority. It will also give rise to idealism and subjectivism. It will do so for this reason, that because everyone interprets for himself sacred scripture and is supposedly inspired by the Holy Ghost, the differences in doctrine will have to will give rise to the idea that something is true for me, but not true for you. And so the Protestant world will become completely infected with the notion of subjectivism. That is, that there is no objective truth. The third bad effect of the free interpretation of scriptures is the personal religious experience as the source of all religion. This situation, which occurred in the 16th century, will in turn cause two things. One, the uh, Pentecostalist movement, and on the other hand, unbelief. The Pentecostalists and other forms of Protestantism which follow them will take the aspect of personal religious experience as the primary form of religion and capitalize on that. On the other hand, the upper classes uh, in Protestant lands will find Protestantism to be completely absurd because they see that there are as many religious groups as there are Protestants. Because each one decides for himself what is true religion by reading sacred scripture. So the intellectual and upper classes of Protestant Europe will fall into something called unbelief. This was a gradual abandonment of belief in a personal God and the embracing of deism, which was a form of natural religion, but very corrupted. According to deism, God, whoever he is, created the world, but after he created it, he abandoned it and wants nothing more to do with it. For this reason, human beings are not obliged to offer him any kind of worship except a certain amount of honor. There, in this system, there are no revealed dogmas. There are no revealed moral laws. In this period, and we're in the, the 17th and 18th centuries now, there is also the rise of Jansenism. This was popularly known as Catholic Protestantism. They kept all of the Catholic piety, including the Mass, and Catholic customs, even the externals of Catholic religious life. But their doctrines and their beliefs were Calvinist. They s sought to remain in Catholic institutions, and they considered themselves Catholics even though they replaced their religion with a form of Protestantism. They had a contempt for the authority of the Catholic Church and for the authority of kings. For this reason, they were condemned repeatedly by the Catholic Church and were also condemned by Catholic governments. And they flourished a great deal uh, in Europe, and especially France and Italy, Austria, but in Europe in general, during the 17th and the 18th centuries. Also, the, in this period, you had a movement known as Regalism, in which the European courts, although Catholic, were demanding of the church more and more concessions toward national churches in the various Catholic lands. In 1776, there is the American Revolution. In 1789, 
these independent American states will ratify a constitution which will establish for the first time in the history of man a godless state. The idea was, and it was straight from John Locke, who was one of the deists that we spoke about, that the state should be indifferent toward religion, it should not persecute it, but the state should be secularistic and indifferent toward religion. So on the eve of the French Revolution in 1789, the Catholic Pope would look out on all of Europe and see a Europe that is infected with Jansenism, infected with regalism, and everywhere a, a collapse of all of the order that had been put in place by, by Constantine and which was perfected during the Middle Ages. So for the first time in the Catholic Church, you have, in a sense, two parties. Among the cardinals, you had the, those who said that the Church should not make concessions to the regalists, but should retain its rights no matter what the consequences. Then you had others who said we should make accommodations to modern Europe and do whatever we can to preserve whatever we still have. Then in 1789 came the French Revolution. This was a political and religious expression of all of the evil movements that I have described up to now. You had an atheistic state. You had naturalistic religion, actually placing a prostitute in Notre Dame and worshiping her as the goddess of reason. And you had a state in revolt against the authority of the Catholic Church. So all of the evil of the Reformation was given a political expression in the French Revolution. With the advent of Napoleon, all of this great mass of evil was spread throughout Europe and established in Europe. So all of the agnostic and subjectivistic thinking of John Locke, which had a political expression in the American state in 1789, now had invaded Europe through the French Revolution and the wars of Napoleon. Needless to say, all of this, the French Revolution and the reign of Napoleon, was an absolute disaster for the Catholic Church. At more or less the same time as the French Re American Revolution and French Revolution, you have the production of philosophy, in, particularly in Germany, which is going to... Uh, give expression to all of the subjectivism of Protestantism. The principal figure in this new movement of idealism is Immanuel Kant, who lived, who was active from about 1775 to the early part of the 19th century. He devised a system in which he said that truth is not defined as the conformity of our minds to reality, but rather the conformity of our minds to our own interior categories. He said that it was impossible to know things as they are in themselves, but that the only thing we know are phenomena, that is the appearances of things. He furthermore said that each of us organizes the phenomena that we receive each in our own way, each according to our own categories, that is, in interior ideas that are infused in us, that come from our own nature. In this system, therefore, it was possible for something to be true for one person, but not true for some, someone else. But at the same time, they could say that they were both faithful to their categories. It is impossible to underestimate the influence of Immanuel Kant on the modern world. Excuse me. Impossible to overestimate 
the influence of Immanuel Kant on the modern world. He, the modern world is a world of Kant. In as much as the, the idea of absolute truth and unchanging truth is something that has disappeared from human minds. He also said that it is impossible to prove the existence of God from reason. But he asserted the existence of God from his own categories. He said God must exist because if God doesn't exist, then the whole moral code would collapse. And he called that the categorical imperative. Immanuel Kant is very important for modernism for this reason, that he established the two ingredients of modernism. These two ingredients, according to St. Pius X, are agnosticism and the religious experience. St. Pius X called the religious experience immanentism. And we see both of these in Kant. We see agnosticism when he says, it is impossible that we know God through reason. He therefore divorced all religion from the world of reason. Yet we see the basis of the internal and immanentist religious experience when he said, God must exist. I have a, an internal experience that God exists. And so after Kant, religion becomes something entirely interior with no relationship to anything exterior or rational. Following upon Kant, you have the transcendental German philosophy of Schelling, Fichte, and Hegel. Uh, Schelling, Fichte, and he uh, Hegel. Hegel. They will uh, present a philosophy of pantheism. In the 1830s, we see the rise of liberal Protestantism with Schleiermacher. And in Tübingen, in, also in the same period, we see the rise of Protestant biblical rationalism under Bauer and Strauss. <clears throat> it is never to be forgotten that the University of Tübingen had a Protestant faculty and a Catholic faculty. Therefore, it was a place in which Protestantism was able to influence Catholic theology a great deal. It should not be forgotten that Ratzinger was a professor at Tübingen as well as Hans Kuhn. At this same time, that is in the period after the French Revolution and the period of the Restoration, we see the rise of liberal Catholicism. Personalities of this period were Lamennais, Montalembert, Dupont-Loup, and Chateaubriand. Lamennais, Montalembert, Dupont-Loup, Chateaubriand. <laughs> they were the principal personalities of liberal Catholicism. The liberal Catholics were those who said, the world has changed from the Middle Ages. We have a new atheistic or indifferent government, and Catholicism must adjust to it. Their idea of adjusting to it was that the Catholic Church should abandon its insistence that the state has the obligation to profess the Catholic faith. Their ideal was a free church in a free country. Their idea was to follow the American uh, practice of being indifferent, that the government should be indifferent to religion, and that therefore the church could do whatever it wanted. This doctrine was very vigorously condemned by Pope Gregory XVI in the 1830s, particularly with the document known as Singulari Nos and Mirari Vos. Pius IX, who was elected in 1846, also vigorously condemned religious liberty and all of the ideas of liberal Catholicism. Nevertheless, liberal Catholicism continued to flourish in Europe. Before the Council, the Vatican Council of 1870, 
We see, for example, Dellinger, very active in Europe as a liberal Catholic. Also, well, in 1870, Pius IX called the uh, Vatican Council, and in that council, the doctrine of papal infallibility was defined. As a reaction to that council, the liberal Catholics, under the leadership of Döllinger and others, had their own council in Munich. And here they condemned the definition of papal infallibility and, and formed their own religion. And they issued documents from this council in Munich, calling for, among other things, the uh, abolishment, uh, the abolition of the uh, celibacy for priests and freedom for theologians to say whatever they want. The reading of the, this document from Munich would remind you of the documents of Vatican II. At the same time, there is in the Catholic Church the rise of biblical rationalism. This became so bad that Leo XIII issued a great encyclical condemning biblical rationalism and giving all of the principles of Catholic biblical scholarship. Biblical rationalists deny or doubt anything supernatural in sacred scripture. They apply all of the principles of agnosticism to sacred scripture. They therefore strip from Roman Catholicism any of its supernatural aspects. At the end of the reign of Leo XIII in 1903, the Catholic Church has the terrible problem that many members of its clergy and high clergy are infected with the heresy of modernism. Modernism, as I said, according to St. Pius X, his encyclical, has two major ingredients. One is agnosticism, the other is immanentism, or the religious experience. He says it contains all of the errors against the Catholic Church and called it the synthesis of all heresies. He said that the modernist speaks out of both sides of his mouth. At times he speaks as the agnostic, that is, as someone who does not believe anything supernatural about the Catholic faith. On the other hand, at times he gives a very pious sermon, speaking as though he had the, a very, very strong interior faith. The difference is that he accepts Kant's theory, his ideas, that religion has nothing to do with reason. That religion even contradicts, excuse me, that reason even contradicts religion. They are also biblical rationalists, that, they, that there is nothing supernatural in sacred scripture, that all of those things are merely stories and fables. But at the same time, they have this interior religious experience, their feelings about God. Their idea is that God is in every man, apart from, uh, simply by nature. That is, God is in every man simply by nature, and that every man discovers God in him and has a different religious experience according to his culture and time. So the Hindu has a different religious experience of God from the Catholic. But according to the principles of Kant, you cannot say that the experience of the Hindu is false any more than you could say that the experience of the Catholic is true. All of these religious experiences have a truth of their own, according to the Kantian principle. Therefore, you could have someone who is at the same time the worst kind of heretic and the most pious person. This heresy embodies all of the unbelief and naturalism and subjectivism that we have described since the Renaissance. And as well, it embodies all of the Protestant idea of supremacy of the religious experience and the human conscience. 
St. Pius X said in his encyclical that if these people succeed in their program for the church, it will destroy the Catholic Church. He also said it would destroy belief in God. For this reason, St. Pius X undertook not only a documentary condemnation of this heresy, but also a very active prosecution of the heretics. There was something in his, in, under the reign of Pius X known as the Sodalitium Pianum. This was a group of priests and even laypersons who would find out who were the modernists in various seminaries and universities and other uh, usually intellectual institutions and report their names to the Vatican. And these persons would be summoned to the Vatican and in many cases sacked. That means were, were removed from their positions or put in positions of very low influence. One of these persons was Angelo Roncalli, who was teaching history in the diocese, church history, in the seminary of the Diocese of Bergamo in Italy. He was accused of reading and using the condemned author Duchenne. It is certain that he was using Duchenne, but when summoned to Rome, he swore to Cardinal de Lai, who was the head of the Sodalitium, that he had never even read Duchenne. Cardinal de Lai will place in his file the words suspect of modernism, this man was elected John the 23rd in 1958. He, among one of the first things he did, was to go to his file and look at what was said of him. And this I know from what Archbishop Lefebvre told me. He spoke to John the 23rd shortly after his election. And John the 23rd told him that he went to his file and he found the words suspect of modernism. And his comment was to Archbishop Lefebvre, imagine me, a modernist. And so this, uh, the, the uh, St. Pius X was the last pope, he died in 1914, he was the last pope to take such a strong practical stance against the modernists. Pope Benedict XV, who was elected in 1914 and died in 1922, suppressed all of the activity of the Sodalitium Pianum. He was elected precisely because most of the cardinals felt that Pius X had been too strong against the modernists. And he represented the party of softness toward the modernists. And this same Angelo Roncalli, who was called to Rome in 1914, will be consecrated a bishop in 1925. There were many others like him, and that fact that he would go from suspicion of modernism to being consecrated a bishop in 11 years' time means that there were, the modernists were able to rise to power under the pontificate of Benedict XV and even under the pontificate of Pius XI. That is not to say that Benedict XV or Pius XI or even Pius XII were modernists. It is only to say that they did not accept the advice of Pius X to be hard on the modernists in the practical order. Therefore, the three pontificates of Benedict XV, Pius XI, and particularly Pius XII, saw a tremendous rise to power of modernist clergy. Yet at the same time, they were able to speak and act like pious Catholics. For example, the book Journal of a Soul by John XXIII contains Catholic piety. There is no agnosticism or modernism in it. Yet at the same time, John XXIII would promote all of the modernist cause at the council. During these pontificates uh, of Benedict XV, Pius XI, Pius XII, you saw the rise of 
Uh, first, ecumenism. Second, the liturgical movement. And third, the new ecclesiology. Ecumenism was a natural consequence of modernism. If all religion comes from an interior experience, then it must be true that all religions have a certain value in the eyes of God and that we should recognize that we all worship the same God. We all are experiencing the same God, but in different ways. And therefore, we should dissolve the borders of our churches and our religions and make one great world religion. Ecumenism denies that there is a single institutional church founded by Christ upon St. Peter, outside of which there is no salvation. The liturgical movement is something that started well in the 19th century with Dom Guéranger, but which went bad after the pontificate of Pius X. The liturgical movement during the 1920s, for example, wanted to see the mass in the vernacular and mass facing the people. In 1926, there was a young priest in Milan who was scolded by his bishop for having said mass facing the people. The name of that young priest was Giovanni Battista Montini. And so it is obvious that he was, from an early age, deeply involved with the liturgical movement. This liturgical movement wanted to make the sacred liturgy a vehicle of ecumenism. Uh, a very um, prominent figure in that was Dom Baudouin. He was a Belgian priest who devised a new ecclesiology based on ecumenism. This new ecclesi ecclesiology taught that the mystical body of Christ is something bigger than the Catholic Church and that the sacred liturgy should be changed. He urged that the sacred liturgy should be changed in such a way as to be more inclusive of other religions. So he would see Protestants as members of the mystical body of Christ, although they were not members of the Roman Catholic Church. He said shortly, be, uh, shortly after the death of Pius XII, what we need is a pope elected who will call a council to consecrate ecumenism. So in 1958, we see the election of John the 23rd. In John the 23rd, we see someone who is saying that unless the church conforms to the modern world in its ideas and its customs, its liturgy, it will not be able to survive. <laughs> he has in his career a strong history of ecumenism. And he, therefore, calls the council to do the precise thing, and that is, as he says, reaffirm the Catholic doctrine, but in new ways that are more appealing to the modern world. Although that sounds like a, an innocent thing to do, the effect was the abandonment of Catholic dogma and the embracing of false new dogmas that were already condemned by the Catholic Church. He, among other things, at the council rejected the, the schemata that had been pre prepared by Cardinal Ottaviani. And he took the schemata which were given or which were prepared by the bishops, the German bishops at Fulda, which documents had been written by Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner was a Jesuit, pantheist, very, very modernist theologian who also happened to have a mistress. So it remains that the fundamental author of the documents of Vatican II is a liberal modernist <laughs> pantheist who had a mistress. You must understand that the modernists were extremely organized for Vatican II. They had everything, as we say, waiting in the wings. That is, 
waiting to be presented uh, at Vatican II. The, uh, another thing that John XXIII did was admit as periti, that means a theological experts, those who had received condemnations before the council. One of these periti was a young German theologian, modernist, radical, by the name of Josef Ratzinger. When I was in the seminary, the modernist seminary in the 1960s, Joseph Ratzinger was considered one of the modernist radicals together with Kuhn and Runner. And when he was called a conservative, I was very surprised because in the seminary, he was a radical modernist. Even in the opinion of the <coughs> modernists in the seminary, he was considered very radical. And he was admitted as a peritus. Though those three theologians, Rahner, King, and Ratzinger, were the minds of that council. Archbishop Lefebvre said that every single morning, after the session of the previous day, you would find in your mailbox a, a, a description of what happened the pr day before and what you should think about it. And the, these uh, papers were produced by that group, Ratzinger, Rahner, and Kung. Hans Kung said, we got more from that council than we ever expected. He does not believe in the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, nor does he believe in the divinity of Christ, nor in papal infallibility. He is a public heretic, yet he was one of the directors of that council. I heard lately that he wants to commit suicide. So the Vatican II then can be accurately described as the victory of those of that section of the clergy that wants to accommodate the Catholic Church to the modern world. And therefore, the principal errors of Vatican II all concern the very errors that we have seen and described up to now. For example, ecumenism. Vatican II's First and principal error is ecumenism. It says that non-Catholic religions are a means of salvation. This is a heresy. It is contrary to the dogma of the Catholic Church, or Pius IX called it a dogma, that outside of the Church there is no salvation. And so there is an explicit heresy in Vatican II. We see in Vatican II the new ecclesiology, that is, that the Church of Christ is something bigger than the Catholic Church. This is in the document Lumen Gentium. This is also for the sake of ecumenism, <laughs> because you cannot go to Protestants saying, we are the Church and only we are the Church, and you are nothing, and, and try to be ecumenical. You also see in the same document collegiality of bishops, whereby the church becomes ruled by a college of bishops, and that the, the college of bishops, it says, has supreme authority over the Catholic Church. And this was done in order to destroy the papacy. Paul VI said the papacy is the greatest obstacle to ecumenism, and so it was necessary to alter the papacy and to substitute a college of bishops for the supreme authority of the church. We also saw the triumph of the liturgical movement in Vatican II and its subsequent reforms. The Catholic Mass was gradually stripped of all of its properly Catholic elements, and it was replaced by a man-centered service which promoted a generic and dogmaless Christianity, and also experimentation and all sorts of liberties in the Mass were encouraged. And then we saw, as well in Vatican II, the very religious liberty which was condemned by Gregory XVI and Pius IX and other popes. Gregory the Sixteenth, well, Pius the Seventh to begin with. Gregory the Sixteenth, Pius the Ninth, Leo the Thirteenth, Pius the Tenth, 
Pius the twelfth. Pius the uh, Pius the ninth condemned the error with his infallible authority in Quanta Cura. So we are bound to believe that the doctrine which Vatican II teaches is in fact an error. And so the the problem of Vatican II is that even in that very council we have statements that are contrary to the to the Catholic faith. And when we examine the post-Vatican II time, we see a development of these errors into yet more horrifying heresies and violations of Catholicism. We see in the past 50 years doctrinal chaos and lack of unity. We see liturgical chaos and lack of unity. Yet unity is one of the marks of the Catholic Church. We see disciplines in the new code of canon law which are sins. For example, it authorizes the giving of Holy Communion to non-Catholics. In the traditional teaching of the Catholic Church, that is a mortal sin of sacrilege. It also authorizes that non-Catholics re- uh, that Catholics can receive communion in non-Catholic churches. That is a sin in the teaching of the Church against the first commandment of God. It is known as communicatio in sacris, and it is a mortal sin. That is very serious because it means that the universal law of what is supposedly the Catholic Church is prescribing something and permitting something which is a mortal sin. Such a thing is contrary to the indefectibility of the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, when we consider the doctrinal deviations of the Council and the moral deviations of the Code of Canon Law, we have the theological problem of how this deviation could come from the authority of Christ. Because if these things are rep- or represent a break from the traditional teaching and moral doctrine of the Catholic Church, it would you would have to conclude that the Catholic Church has defected if indeed they come from the authority of the Catholic Church. Pope Pius XII said that the authority of the Pope And the authority of Christ is a single authority. Therefore, anything that is universally prescribed by the Pope, or even permitted, must be assigned also to the authority of Christ. So Catholics, after Vatican II, have a very, very serious problem, and that is... How do we deal with these changes that contradict Catholic doctrine and morals? We are seeing the natural development of this break and a confirmation of the fact that it is a break in some of the actions of Bergoglio. For example, that he himself called on the telephone a woman in Argentina who has been living in adultery for 20 years in a false marriage. The Vatican admitted that he made the phone call, but merely said those are private conversation. But it shows that at one at the, and the same time, he was promoting adultery and sacrilege against the Blessed Sacrament. This is very significant, for even if one wants to say that is his private advice, Nevertheless, it shows that someone who is heretical on the point of view of adultery and sacrilege against the Blessed Sacrament can be elected a pope in this religion. The sixth commandment is thou shalt not commit adultery. Therefore, there is no possible way in which he can escape the fact that he is promoting adultery, something which is condemned by God. And... He also praised the work of Cardinal Casper for the Synod, which is coming very soon, in which Cardinal Casper has devised a a plan to permit people in general to approach the sacraments even though they are in adultery. In this awful document of Casper, uh, excuse me, 
commenting on this awful document of Casper, which promotes adultery, Bergoglio said, it is like doing theology on your knees. That is a quotation of something that was said to seminarians in ages past, that they have such a veneration for their studies, that they are studying God, that they should do their theology on their knees. So he has made a mockery of this beautiful thought by approving of adultery as theology on your knees. When the woman protested to Bergoglio that her local priest said she could not receive Holy Communion, his response was, some priests are more papist than the Pope. I cite this incident only because it is indicative of the new religion, the, the new dogmas and morals of this religion, that this man, while supposedly remaining Pope, could say these things. He is reflective of the rest of the modernists and of the new religion of Vatican II. Then there is his well-known statement, who am I to judge? This was said in relation to those who are committing unnatural vice. And this is now being said all over the world as a type of flag to justify any kind of immorality. Not too long ago, I saw a very interesting tweet which said, who am I to judge has become the flag of a church which is demolishing itself. And therefore the Catholics are faced with a dilemma of how to preserve the Catholic faith despite this 50 years of promulgation of something which is contrary to Catholicism. There are various ways of reacting to it. The, some have reacted in this way, that we should do what we can to preserve the traditional Mass and give a good interpretation to Vatican II and remain within all of the structures that profess modernism. This is the position of the indult Mass movement, and which has become the most proprio Mass, and also of various congregations, the Fraternity of St. Peter, and of Christ the King and various other congregations. Then there is the system of the Society of St. Pius X. They say on the one hand that the modernist hierarchy, that is the hierarchy that professes modernism, is the Catholic hierarchy, but that we should resist them, effectively ignore them as if they don't exist, and establish an apostolate in defiance of that. In this apostolate, they seek to draw people away from the person whom they say is the Pope and the bishops. Yet at the same time, they profess to be united to Bergoglio and his bishops. The third way of reacting to the problem is to say that those who promote the religion of Vatican II do not in fact have the authority of Christ. This conclusion is drawn for this reason that since the authority of Christ protects the church from defection, if Vatican II is a defection, it cannot come from the authority of Christ. This principle that the authority of Christ, that is the authority of the hierarchy, cannot promulgate to the whole church something false or something evil is a principle that is absolutely unassailable. There is no theologian that denies it. In fact, it is something that pertains to faith because it, it is unthinkable that a church that is protected by the assistance of Christ could promulgate something that leads us into error and to hell. Therefore, if one says that Vatican II and its religious practices afterwards are false because they are not Catholic, then you are bound to draw the conclusion that those who promulgated them cannot be the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. 
So it is, it is necessary that every Catholic examine for himself what is this religion that has come from Vatican II? This religion that has come from Vatican II is one of two things. Either it is a continuation of Catholicism under different forms, or it is a break with Catholicism and is a new and false religion. Either it is Catholic or it is not Catholic. There is nothing in between Catholic and non-Catholic. If it is Catholic, it means that all of its doctrines, the disciplinary laws, and liturgical practices are completely in accordance with the Catholic faith. If that is true, then we have no objection to it, and we should all embrace it without any question or resistance. But if it is a break from Catholicism, then we must resist it with all of the force that all of the mar martyrs and doctors of the church opposed er error and heresy in the history of the church. And we must draw the necessary conclusion that the people who promulgated and continue to promulgate this false religion are not the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. And that is how I will end this conference. And that is an appeal to you to analyze the changes of Vatican II and the doctrines contained in Vatican II and the whole history of the post-Vatican II reforms and ask yourself, are these Catholic or not? Thank you for listening. So the question was that if you understand it correctly, then your Excellency's opinion is that uh, the institution currently uh, in residence in Rome is no longer the Catholic Church and the hierarchy is no more than where is the Catholic Church operating right now and uh, is the Catholic Church or this external group which is not the Catholic Church going to elect new Pope or why if then if yes then when and if no then why not? Uh, my answer is that uh, the institution of the Catholic Church exists and must exist until the end of time. What I said in my conference is that this modernist hierarchy does not have the authority to rule the Church. But at the same time, and something I did not say, is that they continue the legal institution of the Catholic Church. The reason for this is that they have never been condemned by Catholic authority or separated from the church by Catholic authority. That is the very heart of the problem. That they are forcing a new religion on Catholic institutions, parishes, churches, seminaries, but at the same time have not been severed from the Catholic Church. That problem is the source of all of the controversy among traditionalists. <coughs> and my position is that whereas on the one hand they lack the authority, they nonetheless continue the institution of the Catholic Church. Annak ellenére, hogy valódi joghatósággal nem rendelkeznek, mégis folytatólagos utódai jogi szempontból a katolikus egyháznak. 
they are nothing more than <coughs> Pope elects and <coughs> Bishop elects who uh, do not have any authority. And therefore you have continuity of institution, but not continuity of authority. The way in which to solve the problem according to that model is that one or some of them convert to the Catholic faith. In such a case, you would have both continuity of institution and continuity of authority. It is impossible that anyone without institutional capacity, uh, without an uh, without representing the institution of the Catholic Church, vote for a pope. A mob cannot elect a pope. And therefore I reject the notion of conclavism, which is essentially to have a mob elect a pope. The reason why such a thing is absurd is precisely because the mob lacks an institutional authenticity. And so we must pray that those who are bishop-elects and pope-elects in this problem convert to the Catholic faith. Ezért imádkozunk el, hogy azok, akik püspök jelöltek, vagy pápa jelöltek, ebben a helyzetben azok térjenek a katolikus hitre. But in the meantime, we must have nothing to do with them, and we also must denounce them as false, a false hierarchy. De amíg ez meg nem történik, addig semmi közünk ne legyen hozzájuk, és muszájukat elutasztanunk, mint egy hamis hierarchiát. There are several groups of Salakantis credit and uh, how uh, generally accepted is this uh, proposal for solution because there are several others who say that uh, God can resurrect the Catholic Church even from one priest and if there is one small group of faithful. Uh, so, uh, How generally accepted is this view that we must wait for the institution to convert back and there is no solution before that? How the question is how widespread yes. is that? I would say of the all of the state of Acantis, <laughs> priests and bishops that I know, I would say probably eighty percent adhere to what I say and twenty percent adhere to the other. Uh, And who is that kind of person? I don't have the I'm just giving a general I just thinking about who's who and what is what. Uh, that's uh, I couldn't give you names. <laughs> So, for example, CMRI, they are, in general, totalists, what we call totalists. Uh, we, they would disagree with what I said. Szervezetben is, hogy ezt, ezt egyesíteni kell újra a 
kitel, és akkor áll végre helyre a teljes jó hatóság. Tehát ezt, ezt a célra nem gondolja. Bishop Dolan and Father Chikara disagree with what I say. Dolan Puskök és Csak a Dalják is ők sem értenének ezzel egyet, amit a elmondott a Puskök úr. Yet at the same time, that does not divide us. De ennek ellenére ez nem verkőzünk éket. Ez megválaszolja a kérdést? Én még azt kérdeztem volna, hogy a jó hogy azt mondta, hogy a Tóra, mert csak az a Így van, így van, van. Hát ő ebben a, ebben a kérdésben van. Így van. Szóval, ő így szerint, de ezt a kérdést kérdés. Szóval, ő így szerint, de ezt a kérdést kérdés. Szóval, ő így szerint, de ezt a kérdést So, uh, why uh, do we consider ourselves any better than the Protestants? Because there is absolutely no uh, disunity concerning the faith. And right away, that makes us differ from Protestants. Mert hogy a hittel kapcsolatban egyáltalán semmilyen különbözőség nincs, és ez már elválaszt a Protestantsoktól. Protestants are divided over matters of doctrine. <coughs> Say the Vacantists are not divided over matters of doctrine. Say the Vacantists are divided either over personal difficulties or sometimes uh, theological controversies which can only be settled by the authority of the church. A Catholic will listen only to the authority of the Catholic Church. Egy katolikus, az csak a katolikus egyház hatóságaira kell, hogy hallgasson. There is no other authority which can settle theological problems. Nincs más hatóság, ami rendezhetni a teológiai problémákat. Therefore, the very divisions among Sede Vacantists concerning theological problems is an attestation of their Catholicism. Éppen ezért a szedokatisták között lévő teológiai kérdések mentén megfigyelti megosztottság, tulajdonképpen ő éppen rámutat a katolikusságukra. Because only the Pope can settle those divisions. Mert a, csak egy pápa tudná lerendezni ezeket a különbségeket. But they are not divisions of faith. De ezek nem a hitételek mentén történő megosztottságok. Translating this question. So, he said that uh, in the Holy Scripture uh, it is stated that several places that when the very sacra, very the uh, uh, so when the offering of the sacrifice ceases and then after 1000 then I don't know how many days uh, the second uh, coming of Jesus is going to happen and so if the novel sort of has uh, been valid then uh, Shouldn't this already have happened, or does this prove that it is still valid? First of all, I am not aware of any any place in sacred scripture in which it says that the sacrifice of the mass will cease. I, I believe that he is referring to certain passages in the apocalypse, which are very difficult to interpret, and uh, which have been applied to various. Um, Times in the Catholic Church. Először is szeretném beszélgetni, hogy én nem vagyok tudatában semmilyen olyan résznek a Szentírásban, ahol egyértelműen azt állítanám, hogy a misáltatot meg fog szűnni. Feltetően egy olyan részre utalhat a kérdező, ami a jelenések könyvében az apokalipszis vonatkozik. Na most ezeket a részeket nagyon nehéz értelmezni, és az egyház életében már sok különböző eszemélyre próbálták őket vonatkoztatni. Saint Jerome said that every word of the apocalypse is a mystery. Saint Jerome said that the apocalypse is a mystery. 
And so we cannot make a, a theology of the present moment based on something which is of doubtful interpretation. Tudod, a gyere helyzet, helyzetológiát nem tudjuk kiokumulálni egy olyan szövegből, aminek képes az értelmezésre. So, as you or sense, you might have guessed, the question is about uh, various messages the uh, Obras ladies are sending to humanity. Uh, Fatima Arud, uh, I think she also mentioned uh, Karavali, which I don't know. So you will not say, and, uh, mm -hmm. but, and many other messages about uh, the various warnings and about uh, masons and other things, and uh, uh, many new prophecies which are arising. Yes, the the Catholic Church does not operate on the basis of private interpretations and, and private apparitions. All of those things that she mentioned are private revelations. The certitude that we have of those revelations comes from the credibility of the witnesses. That that it. Tehát a katolikus egyház az a működését nem a magánkínálkoztásokra alapozza. Bármiféle bizonyosságunk, ami ezekkel kapcsolatban lehet, az csak a tanúknak a szavahihetőségén keresztül vezet. Uh, and therefore none of those messages, uh, even if the apparition is approved by the church, none of the messages have the weight of the public revelation that has been given to the church. And therefore they uh, because they lack the certitude of faith they cannot be used as a basis of our reaction to the problem of heresy within the walls of the church. Uh, they remain, these messages remain very speculative and uh, our assent to them is conditional upon the credibility of the person who has revealed them. És az, hogy mennyiben fogadjuk el őket, az feltételes azon, azon múlik, hogy mennyire bírunk a személyben, aki kapja őket. When the church approves an apparition, it is simply to say that in the best judgment of, of clergy who have looked into it, investigated it, uh, it seems to be a true apparition. That's all it's saying. Amikor az egyház úgymond jóra hagy egy jelenést, az csak annyit jelent, azt mondja ki az egyház, hogy a akik az ügyel foglalkoztak azok a, azok a papok és püspökök, amennyire meg tudták állapítani, úgy tűnik, hogy valódi. And the church, even in an approved apparition, is not guaranteeing the truth of any of the alleged or, or, or claimed messages. <coughs> De még egy ilyen jóvalót jelenés esetében sem garantálja az egyház az általagos üzeneteknek a tartalmát. For example, Pope Pius XI condemned, uh, I think in the 1920s or 30s, the uh, commonly promulgated uh, uh, message of La Salette in which it says that the Rome will become the seat of the Antichrist. Például 11. Pius pápa a 20-as vagy 30 as években elítélte a széles körben terjesztett La Salette üzenetet, amiben azt szerepelt, hogy Róma az Antikrisztus székévé válik. So it is simply an unreliable source for deciding what we must do in order to protect our faith. Okay, so there are two points. One is that uh, we have heard in the presentation that uh, uh, Bagonio has uh, approved the Casper's message said that it's a theology done these, but we didn't hear what the exact message was, what it was abused, and also uh, the content of this private conversation with the Argentinian woman. Has it ever been relieved? Is there an audio recording, or how can we really know what was said and what was not said? 
an issue of the first, the document uh, of Casper, which was supposed to be a secret to a consistory, was in fact uh, uh, revealed by the Vatican. So we know what the content was. Uh, secondly, and no, there is no recording of the conversation, but the activity of the Vatican press office after it uh, provides moral certitude that the conversation is accurate. If the comment, as I said, was that the they admitted the phone call, but they said that these are the personal ideas of the Pope. If that story had been invented by the press, the Vatican would have denied it absolutely. Furthermore, it is entirely consistent with what Casper uh, has been saying and, and uh, Bergoglio as well concerning Holy Communion given to adulterers. And even uh, Mueller, who is a uh, Nova Sordo Cardinal Mueller, um, uh, has uh, come out uh, saying that we must preserve the church's teaching concerning adultery. So there is there is a uh, an obvious conflict in the Vatican. Ironically, Müller is an arch-modernist, but he has emerged as a conservative in the Bergoglio Vatican. <laughs> so there are two questions. The one is if we can only say uh, a yes or no answer, <coughs> then can we say with full certitude that the new type of ordination, either the episcopal or the priest ordination, is uh, invalid? Episcopal and priestly? Episcopal. Uh, Episcopal. Yes, it is certainly invalid. So the question is that what can in a practical order a, a Catholic living in the county do if he has no access to the for a confessor, no access to a priest who, who has not been ordained by a bishop ordained by the new right? Or is it is it acceptable to go to a priest uh, to a priest working in the Greek Catholic? A church who has been uh, ordained in the Greek Catholic Rite, which I guess hasn't been so badly reformed, but in fact in communion with the current church. No, you cannot separate the sacraments from the church. The, the sacraments must come from the church, and in order that the sacraments be Catholic, the priest who is administering them must administer them in the person of the church, that is St. Thomas's term, that means he must be an agent of the Catholic Church. 
nem lehet leválasztani a szentségeket az egyházról. A, amikor egy pap egy szentséget kiszolgáltat, akkor ezt mindig az egyház személyében szolgáltatja ki. Ezt Kölnő Szent Tamás is, tól is tudjuk. Tehát, That the priest who administers the sacrament must be an agent of the Catholic Church. If he had adheres to a false sect or if he professes heresy publicly, he cannot be considered an agent of the Catholic Church. So although the sacrament may be valid, it cannot be received by a Catholic. I will give you a historical example. In the French Revolution, there were many priests who uh, swore to the constitutional uh, the constitution of the clergy. By that fact, they became schismatics. Pius the sixth. Well, excuse me. Uh, Pius, yes, Pius VI said to the Bishop of Strasbourg the following, that hosts consecrated by those priests must not be put in the tabernacle and must not be distributed to the faithful, even though they're valid. <coughs> változtattak át, tehát akik uh, aláíták a francia alkotmányt, uh, azokat uh, soha ne tegyük be a tabernákumokba, és ne hozzák szét a hívek között, annak ellenére, hogy uh, maga szentség érvényes. Because precisely they proceed from priests of schism. Mert hogy uh, szakadárpapoktól származnak. So in the practical order, someone who is deprived of sacraments must be faithful to the rosary and to uh, all of his prayers in a very fervent and special way and also must do his best to get to a true mass whenever he can. Tehát aki olyan ilyen helyzetben hogy nem jut hozzá a szentségekhez, az tartsa ki nagyon az imádságban, a rózsafűzérben, és különleges módon legyen uh, kitartó, és uh, I encourage the faithful to do everything they can to seek out priests who are not connected with the modernist heresy and to, uh, or the modernist hierarchy and to uh, give them the means to say mass in their area. Keressenek olyan katolikus papot, akik nincsenek kapcsolatban a modernista lehetnekséggel, vagy a hamis hierarchiával, és teremtsék meg a feltételeket, hogy az ő lakóhelyi közében mi se tudjanak bemutatni. So she's asking that as a private person, what is your excellency's opinion about the allegation that we are living in the times of the, the final times and the second coming of Christ might happen in our, in our own life? Well, I think What is certain is that we are living in what St. Paul described as the great apostasy from the faith. That is described in 2 Thessalonians. It is the uh, second condition that is described by the Catechism of the Council of Trent for the Second Coming. The Catechism of the Council of Trent mentions three conditions, that three things that must take place before the Second Coming of Christ. Ez a katechizmus három dolgot említ, aminek mindenképp meg kell történnie Jézus második eljövetel előtt. 
The first is the preaching of the gospel to the whole world. The second is the great apostasy from the faith. The third is the coming of the Antichrist. When that was written around 1570, none of those things had taken place. Now, two of those things have taken place. In the 19th century and early 20th century, the gospel was preached to the entire world. When that was finished, we began the great apostasy from the faith. So, in my opinion, that all of that is certain, in my opinion, I think that we are in the advent of the Antichrist. That is to say that the world is being prepared through its apostasy for the acceptance of a very evil ruler. And God has permitted this very defection from the faith in order to permit the coming of the Antichrist. There are two theories concerning the coming of the Antichrist. One is that it will coincide with the second coming of Christ. The other theory, which is held by many theologians, is that the uh, time of the Antichrist will conclude with a victory for the Catholic Church. A másik elmélet, amit sok teológus van, hogy az Antikrisztus korszakának a vége az egybefogás a katolikus egyház egy nagy győzelmével. And that the church will enjoy a time of peace and flourishing that it has never seen before. És az egyház egy olyan kort élvezhet majd, amikor olyan békében és világzásban lesz része, amire is soha nem volt példa. But that the spirit of revolution and apostasy will appear again. And after that, the end of the world. Which of these are true, I don't know. And whether the Antichrist is, is coming soon, I don't know. As St. Peter says, one day is, is like a thousand years for God, and a thousand years are but one day. So, uh, I try to summarize. So, uh, at some days, the Sacred Scripture says that uh, we will hear about different wars, but we shouldn't worry. Uh, and there are some theories which say that the Antichrist will enter the scene as the big uh, peacemaker. And so, what are we going to do now? We have talked with uh, various priests, but they avoided taking a clear stance, maybe because they are uh, afraid of losing their uh, existence. Uh, and so, what are we going to do now? Is the rosary the key for us so that there are no valid sacraments? I think. That was the well, uh, the the circumstances to answer the first part concerning the coming of the Antichrist are in many cases speculations: uh, who he will be, where he will be from, um, uh, the conditions in which he will arrive. It's probably true that uh, the. Uh, he will be a, a type of savior of the world in the naturalistic sense. That is, the, the world may be on the brink of a nuclear war, uh, <laughs> which seems possible soon, and, and uh, that, um, that he will in some way uh, 
put it all together and make a, a great world government where everyone will live at peace, but under the rules of, of naturalism and international socialism. Um, May that, I translate? Yes. Uh, that, um, a nagyik izraelvetével kapcsolatos gondolatok azok nagy részre spekuláció alapszanak, tehát az, hogy hogyan fog eljönni, milyen körülmények között mi fog történni, ezekről valójában nem sokat tudunk. Most így könnyen elképzelhetőleg látszik, hogy valóban mint egyfajta naturalista világi megváltó lép majd be a színre, aki például megakadályoz egy nagy küszöben a nukleáris háborút, ami most éppen nem tűnik annyira távolinak ez az elképzelés és majd mondjuk kialakít a nagy világkormányban az emberek békében élhetnek, de naturalista és nem és szocialista alapokon. When people uh, have very deep fears, they are willing to accept great changes in politics and government. Amikor az embereknek mély félelmeik vannak, akkor hajlamosak elfogadni drasztikus változásokat is a politikában és az uralmi rendszerben. History has proven that. So uh, that's the first part. The, the second, that there are many priests who should be reacting that don't. Uh, each one has his own motive. I guess in many cases it is a motive of, it is a material motive. What, where will I go? What shall I do? Uh, that, that is sometimes their motive. Hát minden pap, akinek lépnie kell, és nem, nem is sem reagál, meg vannak saját okai, van, valóban van, amikor a anyagi motiváció a háttérben, hogy nem tudja, hogy hol menjen, mit csináljon. Ez is egy lehetséges motiváció. But in other cases, it's uh, theological problems that they uh, just cannot think about the hierarchy defecting from the faith in a general way. De sok más esetben teológiai nehézségek vannak, egyszerűen nem tudják elképzelni azt, hogy az egész hierarchia egyszer elhagyja a hitet. And so they look at the at Vatican II and its reforms, and they try to see Catholicism in it. És azért úgy nézik a zsinatot és az azt követő reformokat, hogy megpróbálnak katolizmus belelátni. Oké, okay, szó. So, uh, um, akkor most a kérdéseket egy pillanatra lezárjuk. So, thank you for your service time. Uh, you found the question session now, and uh, we will be here for a while. Uh, most még egy darab még itt leszünk, uh, még maradt a fogácsából, és ha valakinek maradt a kérdései, akkor azt még feltehetjük most is a körben a Füsök úrnak. They that hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will soar as with eagle's wings. They will walk and not grow faint. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you haven't. Click the bell for notifications of new uploads. And know that I have you in my prayers. And God has you in his heart.